Are the events that are going to occur on September 23rd, 2017, the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 12? We'll take that question into the forge. Hi, I'm Ron Matson. We're going to be looking at a topic in this episode of The Forge that for many is pretty emotional. It's created a lot of interest on the internet. We've had hundreds of questions come in to us here at Cornelia House, but I'm going to choose one I think that summarizes it best. Howard from the UK writes, I have read a lot on the internet about September 23rd, 2017 being the fulfillment of the Revelation 12 prophecy. What is your understanding? And so we're going to be looking at this in some detail. Uh, We're going to be taking you through a thought process of critical thinking that I want you to be patient as you go through it. I would encourage you to watch this whole video. Don't just watch a portion of it and and, uh, trash the result without going to the complete conclusion. In fact, in the end, we've got some surprises for you there. We want you to look at the whole thing. So here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to look at what some of the experts are saying. We're going to listen to what they're saying. We're going to summarize their evidence. We're going to point out some problems that they have. And then ultimately, we're going to let you decide based on uh, the information you've been given. Uh, Certainly, this is one of those. Because it is a future event, there are lots of opinions. And we're going to try to deal with uh, where the information is coming from, what evidence they have, uh, and then leave the decision over to you. Now, there are some ground rules that we want to establish as we go into uh, this thorny patch. Um, First of all, we need to establish the fact that truth is not established by what is trending. So often people say, have you read all of the posts that's available there on the Internet? Well, trending is not always uh, the right place to uh, find truth. In fact, Um, You might have heard this quote um, given by some people. It reads, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Unfortunately, of course, that was the propaganda minister of the Nazi party under Adolf Hitler uh, that made that quote famous. I like to put it this way. Uh, There is no story more insidious than a story that the bear loves to hear. And so we need to be careful here that we're not uh, just putting ourselves into a situation where we're believing something because we want to hear something that's exciting like that. In fact, there's a ground rule here uh, that we get from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. So again, I encourage you to listen to the whole presentation, do your own research. Here at Cornelia House, we encourage people to be a good Berean in that you uh, have a readiness to hear, but you search the scriptures daily to see if those things are true. So uh, we're going to try to give you some information uh, and enable you to be able to make your decision with regards to this um, belief uh, on September 23rd. Now, We'll be looking at the premise. We'll be looking at the proof, that is, what evidence do they have. We'll be looking at the perspective, and that's how they view their evidence. And we'll be looking at any possible problems that they may have. Now, uh, as we do that, uh, I have chosen three individuals that appear by virtue of Uh, the uh, information on the internet appear to be the experts or certainly the ones that most people seem to be going to. We'll be looking first at Scott Clark. Scott Clark is an evangelist uh, and uh, we'll come on to a little more about him later. We're going to look at Robert Breaker, who's a pastor. We're also going to look at Steve Chayococolanti and uh, see what he has to say. He's in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia 
When we look at Scott, we see that uh, on his website, it reads, Scott, Scotty to his close friends, has been a student of the Bible for many moons, 360 new moons roughly, um, from a preteen Catholic altar boy to a converted Protestant worship leader, from working uh, as a drummer with touring Christian music acts to serving on international mission teams, Scott has lived his life in service of the kingdom. Now, the reason why I chose Scott was because uh, uh, he was really the first to begin to post videos on this subject way back in 2011. And uh, so a lot of people refer to him as uh, the one sort of kicking this whole discussion off on the internet. Robert Breaker, on his website, we read, Evangelist Robert Breaker served as a missionary in Honduras for seven years and now currently works as a missionary evangelist to the Spanish-speaking people. He is the pastor of the Cloud Church, which is an online website, was started in September of 2014. His YouTube video, September 23rd, 2017, What's Gonna Happen, has had over 4.8 million views. And then we have uh, Steve uh, Chai Colanti, and uh, his website says, Pastor of Discovery Ministries out of Australia is an author and speaker who has traveled to 40 nations. His book, From Buddha to Jesus, in 2017, became the second best-selling Christian book of all time in Thailand. Um, when I did um, early research on this subject, uh, many of the people I talked to considered uh, him to be the best and have the best balanced teaching on this subject. Uh, and many of his YouTube videos on this subject uh, have had views in excess of 950,000 views. And so these are people that uh, have uh, said a lot and... Um, and people are using them as the experts. So we'll use them to establish what's being said, what the premise is, and take a look at some of their proof. Now, let's take a look at what Scott is saying. The biggest topic in Bible prophecy for those who are awake and aware is Revelation 12. Because it looks like there is a sign in the heavens in September of this year, 2017, that lines up exactly with Revelation 12, 1 and 2, which describes a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She is in labor, and she is giving birth to a male child. Once born, is immediately caught up to the throne in heaven due to the threat of a dragon who tries to devour the child as soon as it's born. The head is already at the throne, the body is on earth, but we have to go to the throne. That's what happens when the birth happens. Revelation 12, 5, the, Revelation 12, 5, the child is born and caught up to the throne. That is the same thing as the rapture, as we meet him in the clouds and then we go to be with him forevermore. The head meets the body. So Scott is one of those that uh, probably have some of the best uh, graphics certainly associated with this topic. Here's a diagram uh, that uh, shows you um, the, the summation of everything. His view is, of course, that um, uh, the event that will take place, the 23rd of September 2017, will be the birth of the church. He says that that took place at Pentecost, was the conception of the church, and that we've been waiting in uh, gestation for some 2,000 years, and the church will be born as it is raptured. And so that's the, the basic idea of what Scott is saying to us. Now let's take a look at what Robert's saying. Could it be that this revelation sign marks something to do with Israel, and we saw it on September 23rd, 2015, as a two-year marker, and God is saying, watch this, watch this, watch this, there's something coming on September 23rd, there's a sign in heaven, which I gave you thousands of years ago to look for, and that's the date that it takes place, and something big is going to happen for Israel during that time. Now let's take a look at what Steve is saying. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. This does not refer to a woman floating through the sky. The simplest, most literal interpretation of this is the constellation Virgo, which will have 
the sun at her head, the moon at her feet, and 12 stars, nine from the constellation Leo and a conjunction of Mercury, Mars, and Venus on her head that makes 12 stars on the 23rd of September, 2017. Remember that date, 23rd of September, 2017. Remember that date. And for this great sign of the woman in the sky, clothed with the sun in her hair, the moon at her feet, 12 garland of 12 stars by her head, right? Two days before that is the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is, we just learned, prophetically, the next thing Jesus will fulfill. He fulfilled four feasts. The next feast, the fifth feast, he, he must fulfill. The next event should be the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the saints. Okay, as we look at Steve's website, we recognize that he is uh, very thorough in terms of his analysis of this, but he's also one who likes to summarize things. And uh, on his uh, videos, we see this summary where he says that the, the woman uh, is uh, collectively is the entity Israel uh, and the Jews. The dragon, of course, is the uh, Satan and the Antichrist and its armies. The child is the church and those caught up is the rapture. And uh, so pretty clear uh, that uh, both uh, of, um, well, all three of these guys take that particular point of view. And so when we look at who the experts are, I think these three guys do a pretty good job of articulating that point of view. Uh, we've listened in short uh, to what they've said. To summarize what they're doing, well, premise number one is that September 23rd, 2017 is the culmination of many signs in the heavens. Premise number two, Revelation 12 is fulfilled as the great sign through the September 20. Uh, uh, 23rd September 2017 conjunction where Jupiter is a symbol of the church and premise number three these events may predict the date of the rapture or certainly the start of the tribulation now as we look at that summation of course the idea here is that people are really excited because they believe this is proof positive that something uh, is really going to happen on that date because of this uh, uh, idea of this great sign in heaven. Now, having looked at that, I'm going to point out some of the problems with this. Um, there are some ground rules that we want to emphasize here. The motto of the forge is to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. I will identify six problems. Six is the number of man. I figure it's, a, it's certainly a good number. No, wait, wait. No, I'll identify seven problems. Seven is the number of completion. So I'll identify seven things uh, that I find uh, cause me a problem with the view of uh, these three individuals and all others who are sort of parroting uh, what these three are saying. So the first I call constellation confusion. There's great danger in the fact that all of the people using this uh, uh, software, it's a free software, and they're novices uh, with astronomy, understanding uh, the cosmos, and they're using a free online uh, software package called Stellarium. Um, it uses retrogression, looking into the past, and it's built upon some mathematical assumptions. Uh, it, uh, but there are things that, of course, it can't compensate for. It can't compensate for the long days of Joshua. Uh, it doesn't have a cosmic cause for the three hours of darkness during the crucifixion of Christ, and on and on and on and on. There are many things that, of course, these types of mathematical tools, they cannot accommodate. And so if you're going to place your confidence, especially when you're going back as far into history as they are, uh, you run a great danger uh, of coming to some wrong conclusions. Now, let's define what a constellation is. A lot of focus on the constellation Virgo, the constellation Leo. Well, a constellation is simply defined as a recognizable group of conspicuous stars that are placed together as imaginary patterns or outlines on the celestial sphere. And uh, so it is just a sense of gathering stars together to tell a story. Now, with regards to the constellations, back in the second century, uh, astronomer Ptolemy estimated that there were 48 constellations. 
1928, they have now formally identified 88 constellations. So what are we talking about here? We're really talking about the 12 or possibly 13 constellations that make up the zodiac. More popular is 12. There are some uh, astrology sites that will tell you they're 13. Nonetheless, that which we are focused on here is the, the foundation of astrology. Uh, it uses the zodiac. This is where they take these constellations, these collections of stars, uh, which they, they uh, put together with some lines, and then they describe them as these uh, creatures or um, uh, d different types of symbols. And uh, so th there's no way you could look at the arrangement of these stars and come up with these kinds of uh, uh, arrangements, and there's lots of uh, folklore and tales associated with how these came about. Uh, we won't try to address them uh, in this session. Perhaps in another forge, we'll look at uh, the uh, viability of uh, the um, zodiac being someplace we would want to look to discuss the issue of uh, certainly biblical prophecy. But certainly looking at its origin, it's primarily used uh, in astrology. Now, there's great danger in connecting these dots. And I'll give you a few examples. There's different tools, connect them in different ways and create different pictures. Now, this is the one that most of you are familiar with. This is the, the uh, constellation Virgo. But if you look at a different tool that displays that same constellation, you'll notice that the lines are different. There is no defining area of the womb. It's constructed differently. Uh, here's another uh, uh, rendition of that same constellation notice the connecting lines are different in each one of them and these are all uh, different views uh, that astrologers uh, would use to describe the constellation virgo a lot has been made about the constellation leo and its nine star you will notice uh, that there are nine stars that it will point out but there are other tools that look at this same constellation and they have 13 stars connected quite differently. They identify some extra stars, and they consider the constellation of Leo to have 13 stars. So we're already running into a problem with trying to establish significance with this idea of Leo having uh, uh, just nine stars. Um, there's actually many more than that in its constellation. There's entire galaxies uh, inside of this space uh, in, uh, as we look outward. But um, depending on how they are defined by who is looking at it and what picture you want to try to draw from it. In fact, here's an interesting uh, view. This is in one of the videos that Scott did where he was uh, using a popular a star tool. He was focused on Virgo, but if you look over his head, he's also using um, the tool uh, Google Sky, and uh, above him is the constellation Leo, and notice the constellation that he's using there doesn't use uh, nine stars. It uses 13, and so it is a problem, uh, and if you want to act as though uh, this is some kind of an absolute. You're really in error in the sense that uh, the connecting of the dots is the problem. And uh, so my number one problem with this is the sense uh, that there's confusion and they're making far too not much about the lines connecting the dots. Another thing that seems to be of confusion, and that is the adding of planets as part of a star constellation, a a popular part of his belief is that uh, these three planets that are in conjunction uh, lying between the constellation um, Leo and Virgo make up the constellation's 12 stars. Well, a planet by any other name is still a planet. It's still a planet. Uh, it's not a star. If God wants to make a sign in the heaven with 12 stars, he'll use 12 stars. Uh, we also see that uh, there's some um, a focus on this idea of uh, Virgo uh, needing a crown. And so you have the top of this 
um, constellation Virgo, and the temptation is to look um, to Leo to be a source of that crown, when in fact, uh, what is generally looked as the crown of Virgo is Kama Bernice. Kama Bernice is a constellation uh, which um, is referred to as a crown. In fact, uh, its uh, second brightest star is called Diadem. And so there already exists uh, in that star pattern uh, a, a constellation uh, which can serve as a crown if that's what you're looking for uh, in the uh, astrological charts. Uh, there is that with uh, the use of comma Bernice. Now, objection number two is this, what I call bandwagon eschatology. Basically, it relies on the hit-and-run tactics of soundbite theology. In other words, uh, if it's punchy, then it plays. The idea that people just want something that's exciting. That's a dangerous thing to join into. We need to be careful not to follow what's trending without fully checking out the whole truth. There may be some excitement that's out there on the internet, but following the trend without checking, fully checking out the whole truth is dangerous. Uh, you need to adopt the legal practice of reading the brief of your adversaries. In other words, don't be afraid to read those who would have an opposing point of view. After all, truth can withstand the test of its adversaries. And certainly what I have seen uh, in my uh, research on this is that once people take a particular point of view, they are only interested in articulating their own point of view. There's also another phenomena here that you need to fight. You need to fight the confusion that's fooled, uh, fueled by FOMO. You know what that is. That's the fear of missing out. People concerning themselves that if they don't embrace something that's trending, they may be missing out on something that's exciting. Well, that may not be the case as we begin to get into this and begin to uh, dig deeper uh, behind some of the issues and the problems associated with this. There's also danger in the use of the internet. It is, after all, called the World Wide Web. Uh, like the gullible people of Athens at the Areopagus, uh, that's also known as Mars Hill, the place of judgment. Uh, Acts 17, 21 tells us, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Boy, that describes the internet, doesn't it? Describes the idea of people just so hungry for something that plays, something that's exciting, that they may be overstepping that which is of real substance. My third problem is that of what I've referred to as conspiracy theory convergence. This is when you incorporate other controversial theories into your proposal to make it work. In other words, you've launched into something, it has a sense of viability within yourself, and yet it it's still got some problems. And so you begin to embrace other conspiracy theories to help it work. Its purpose, to fill in the holes in your theory. And it adds the appearance of additional research, which is, of course, by others. Here's a video that I found on the internet that I find uh, really encapsulates this whole thing very well. We are on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It is 3 in the morning on September 23rd, 2017. The first constellation in the great sign is rising above the horizon. This is Leo, the constellation of the royal lion. When the dawn breaks, we'll see that Leo is worn as a crown of royalty by the virgin princess. The lion forms the appropriate crown for her because she is of the house of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Significantly, this is the highest royal lineage of all the nations. This means the virgin is also born of the lineage of the high scepter of the seed of Adam. In her belly is the second Adam, the savior of the world. On this fateful day, the virgin is clothed in the sun and the moon is at her feet. Sunlight floods the sky. And since the Virgin is clothed in the sun, we cannot see her, so we turn off her artwork. But the prophecy clearly states that the great sign is to appear in the heaven. High noon approaches. 
Then, on this special day, the sun turns as black as sackcloth, and the stars quickly fill the sky. Just like on the day of the crucifixion, it will remain dark for an incredible three hours. Wait a minute. What did he just say? It will remain dark for an incredible three hours. So we have this convergence of planets and stars, the rising of a constellation in full daylight, and somehow at midday, the sun's going to be darkened. He says, then on this special day, the sun turns as black as sackcloth and the stars quickly fill the sky. What is going to cause this three hours of darkness? Well, as we go to uh, Scott, Scott Clark, he introduces the idea that quite possibly it could be caused by the uh, influence and intervention of what is referred to as Planet X. He leads you to a man named David Mead, who has done an, uh, a lot of research and uh, produced lots of uh, videos with regards to Planet X or, or Nabiru. It's a planet which is 10 times bigger than Earth. It's 20 billion miles away. Its orbit is 10 to 20,000 years in its cycle. And basically what he's saying is that this uh, planet will arrive in our solar system just at the right time to create an, a, a total eclipse of the sun and then bring with it uh, the uh, devastation uh, that is uh, articulated and identified for us in the book of Revelation. And what we have is we have this, these asteroids that are following this planet, uh, and, and they will eclipse the sun and, um, and, and bring about uh, the judgment that is especially there uh, as a result of what is referred to as the trumpet judgments. Uh, so, uh, again, trying to draw in these various conspiracy theories to uh, bring in some evidence that will be necessary for this constellation to appear. It's Robert Breaker who introduces the idea of the Bethlehem star theory. You can read more about that at this website. But basically what they say is that the brightest event of this convergence of Jupiter, um, the brightest events occurred in 2 BC. The only big problem with that, of course, is that Herod the Great, the king who directed the Magi to Bethlehem, died in 4 BC, two years earlier. The Jewish historian Josephus makes reference to that. And so the birth of Christ would have had to have been at least two years before that, 6 B.C. is what some say, or earlier. And so trying to make it work uh, with this convergence of Jupiter and Regulus, a star in the uh, Virgo constellation, is something that just doesn't work. When we look at Steve... We recognize that he has chosen something that will uh, bring about an event. He's looked at a comet, Comet 67P, uh, and that it will be um, in a uh, convergence with the moon. Uh, he makes a big deal out of the fact that uh, Comet 67 is arriving 50 years after 1967. Uh, he looks at this Rosetta um, spacecraft uh, that, um, that uh, orbited it. It's from the European Space Agency and so on and so forth. Lots about that. But again, if you want to know more about this, go look at his, uh, his YouTube video on this and he'll um, go quite a bit into it. But the big deal for him is that uh, this uh, comet with a, uh, with a measuring device uh, that uh, uh, was placed there by the Euro European Space Agency uh, it's called Comet 67. It's a Jupiter-class comet, uh, and um, uh, that's arriving 50 years after 1967. Uh, and so, again, I think they're, they're reaching a lot here. We also see Steve as an individual who likes to link things together. Um, he looks at the first of what uh, is referred to as the first of the four blood moons. It occurred on... Uh, 15th of April 2014 and uh, he looks at the Feast of Trumpets which is coming up uh, September uh, 21st 
of this year. Uh, and he counts the days as 1,260 days. He also uh, puts together the idea that if the rapture of the church is indeed um, 23 September 2017, that we should be, and that's the birth of the church, we should be able to see something take place nine months earlier. And so he, he encourages his uh, viewers to look at December 23rd, 2016. Now, by the taping of this program, of course, that's a, that's a date in the path. Not, nothing of any significance took place on uh, 23 uh, December um, 2016. He then makes an issue about the fact that eight months, uh, President Trump was inaugurated. And after all, his name is Trump. And therefore, uh, eight is the number of new beginnings. And so Trump is president and the Feast of Trumpets would have some kind of prophetic link. And this is the type of conspiracy theory convergence, which is very common uh, on the internet and we need to watch out for. Number four on my hit list is what I refer to as eschatological myopia. This is when you are explaining a future thing only one way as seen through the narrow predisposition that you already have. Now, a caution to that. You need to acknowledge and blind your own prejudice if you're going to be looking at something, especially which is in the future. You need to research all the possible solutions. You know, we read in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearketh unto counsel is wise. And so even there, the wisest man on the planet, Solomon, is telling us, be careful about just believing that which you're comfortable with. You need to acknowledge your own, your own prejudice here. And you need to search diligently the whole subject out. Or you may find yourself in the hall of fools. Now, this eschatological uh, myopia I believe this condition is identified by two characteristics, isolation and insistence. I call them the two eyes of ignorance. You know, again, Proverbs 18 tells us, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. What's really disturbing to me is to recognize that so often when I listen to these and others on this subject, it would almost appear as though all they want to do is tell you what their opinion is and how everyone else is wrong. How, in fact, one of uh, the presenters that I've uh, placed for in one of his presentations actually says, all the pastors have got that one wrong. I'm the one who's understanding what God is really saying. Wow. That's quite an arrogant statement, actually, uh, especially as it deals with things that are in the future. There's a great danger in declaring future things with great certainty. It didn't work out too well for Peter when he did that. You know, in the ministry of Jesus, there was a point when he had come down uh, from uh, his Mount of Transfiguration. Peter had witnessed something fantastic. Jesus begins to tell his disciples about what would happen at the end of his journey in Jerusalem, that he would go up there, that he would be delivered into the hands of the Pharisees uh, and the rulers of Israel, that they would take him, that they would uh, crucify him, but on the third day he'd rise again. And it was Peter who believed he had better understanding of what the prophetic events were going to be. He actually found himself rebuking Jesus. And of course, you're all familiar with what Jesus said to him. He said, get behind me, Satan. And sometimes we need to acknowledge that if we begin to come up with some new idea that's contrary to Scripture, if it's new, it may not be true. And if it's true, it doesn't need to be new. And so we need to be careful when we're dealing with especially end times events. Speculation is not scholarship. Any speculation needs to come with an acknowledgement of uncertainty. As you're dealing with, with future events, you need to acknowledge a sense that this is what I believe, this is what's possible, 
but leave the listeners with the sense that you're uncertain because you cannot be certain. It's a prophetic event. It hasn't happened yet. There also needs to be an awareness of its potential impact on the rest of Scripture. In other words, you cannot interpret Scripture in isolation. Paul told the Ephesian elders that he did not neglect to declare to them the whole counsel of God. And so we need to look at this all within the context of all Scripture and certainly within respect to all eschatological or all end times Scripture. It needs to fit in there somehow. Which brings me to my fifth problem with this view. I call it the tribulation timeline trouble. You need to have, when you look at end times things, a consolidated view of all the end times event. To do so, it's very difficult. One in which every event is slotted into its place. For most prophecy scholars, the framework for this final timeline is revealed in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. There we see this framework in 25, 26, and 27, the 69 seven-year periods, which would bring about the recognition of the Messiah in Jerusalem, the interval period, verse 26, and verse 27, the 70th week. If we take a closer look at this 70th week, we recognize that it was Jesus Christ himself who called the mid-event the abomination of desolation. And that he called the Great Tribulation. Many refer to the seven-year period as the Tribulation, but that's really uh, a misuse of the term. The Tribulation period, the Great Tribulation period, is the last three and a half years or 1260 days. Now, with regards to the 70th week, there are a number of views with regards to the rapture of the church. If you are premillennial, that is, Jesus Christ is going to return physically to the earth before uh, the millennial period, there is the post tribulation view, there is the mid 70th week or mid trib view, as it's often referred to, and there is the pre tribulation view. Again, Uh, The uh, last two, the mid and the post, are linked with specific events. Uh, The post-trib linked with the end of the 70th week. The mid-trib is is, uh, 1,260 days uh, from the end, and so those are fixed points that we could measure down to the day. Pre-trib, there is no fixed point. We just simply know what causes uh, or triggers the 70th week is when there is Uh, an enforcement of a covenant and there's been lots of speculation by people with regards to what they believe that is but during this period of time uh, it is believed that the judgments uh, that are revealed in uh, revelation take place during this time we of course have the four horsemen of the apocalypse the white red black and pale horse that come forth as described uh, in uh, chapters six and seven And during their time, of course, one quarter of the earth's population is killed. We then have the three remaining seals, uh, between seal six and seven, of course, the 144,000, 12,000 of 12 tribes of Israel are sealed and then protected by God. And then the final seal is revealed and there's silence in heaven. We have the seven trumpet judgments. Again, uh, these judgments seem to be associated with um, great devastation on the earth. There is all kinds of of, uh, asteroid uh, uh, activity uh, and things falling upon the earth. The first one is blown. A third of the earth's vegetation is destroyed. The second, a third of the seas and a third of the waters, a third of the heavens. Uh, There's this uh, locust army that comes up from the bottomless pit, uh, there's the preparation of a 200 million man army, uh, and so on and so forth. And the seventh, when it's blown, there's the declaration of victory. And of course, during this time, the remaining uh, third of the earth, so between a quarter and a third, we now have 50% of the earth's population has been killed uh, during uh, these 
uh, outpours of God's judgment and wrath upon the earth. And of course, then we have uh, the seven bold judgments, uh, chapters 15 and 16 of the book of Revelation, where those who have survived to this point, they have boils, the sea is turned to blood, the rivers are turned to blood, they are scorched by the sun, there's great darkness on the earth, the river Euphrates is dried up, and eventually when the seventh bowl is poured out, there's heard from heaven the statement, it is done. Now again, as you look at these three uh, uh, judgments, there is a lot of... um, Uh, discussion among biblical scholars as to how to uh, parse them, how to put them together. Uh, There is what's referred to as the sequential view that one leads into another, leads into another. And of course, um, good scholars will point out there seems to be many last events that don't line up very well. There is the recapitulation view, and that is that all of them are happening simultaneously. Uh, But the problem with that is they don't overlay very well. And the third view is that called the telescopic view. And that is that each one of them go through the six uh, judgments in sequence uh, in the gap of the sixth to seventh. And so um, basically it represents uh, prophetic parenthesis. At any rate, how you package these together, there's a lot of destruction taking place on the earth. That's the main thing that I want to leave you with here. No matter how you look at it, there's a lot of destruction and death upon the planet. And yet, um, uh, these guys that I've viewed seem to be able to to place uh, this event with the rapture of the church and the destruction of the planet all in one nice neat little package, all beginning on the 23rd of September 2017. Number six, I point out what I call expositional consistency. This is the idea of how do you break down the scripture? How do you explain? As we are dealing with allegorical imagery here, we need to be very careful. Allegory can be an invitation to invent. So we need to be careful when we're dealing with allegorical language within the scripture. Wherever possible, we'll use the hermeneutic principle. That's the study of how you you um, explain scripture, the hermeneutical principle of expositional constancy. In other words, the meaning of the word or image is most often defined by its first use or definition in the Bible. And so this is a practice use, especially when you're dealing with allegorical imagery and certainly with regards to anything that's allegorical and prophetic. So it's called the law of first mention. Now, again, just to take a look at this and establish a a baseline here, here's a quote from Dr. Donald Carson. He was the professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He says, a text without a context is a pretext as a proof text. In other words, just taking a text out of its context is not proof of anything. There is a real problem. This is when you're misrepresenting the meaning of the text by reading into the text what you want it to say. And we need to identify that and be careful that we don't fall into that. When we see something that looks exciting, looks possible, how does it stack up with the rest of Scripture? And so we're going to take a little bit of a look at the the passage, uh, Revelation 12, 1 to 5, and just look at that in a little more detail. So let's begin. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now clearly, this is a woman of very special honor. Now there are four women mentioned in the book of Revelation. There's Jezebel mentioned in chapter 2. There's this one uh, mentioned in chapter 12. There's the harlot referenced in Revelation 17 and 18, and the bride, which is referenced in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, and chapter 21, verses 2 to 9. Now, it's widely accepted the woman of Revelation 12 represents the nation of Israel. And so when we use expositional consistency or the law of first mention, 
The first time we come across this imagery of an individual being clothed with, with something from the cosmos, we find it in Genesis chapter 37, verse 9, in this vision that Joseph had. We read beginning in verse 9, he dreamt yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I dreamt a dream and more, and behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. In other words, what happened there uh, was this image of himself, only these sun, moon, and stars were now bowing down, the sun and the moon representing the father and the son of Israel, the stars representing his brothers. Obviously, there's 11 because he is the 12th. We read in verse 2, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Throughout Scripture, we see Israel described as a woman in travail. In Isaiah 66, Jeremiah 4, and Micah chapter 4. And we know that Israel is to be used to bring forth the Messiah. Isaiah 9, 6 is a great example of that. Moving on to verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And he drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and he cast them down to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her as soon as it was born. And so the great red dragon, who is it? Well, fortunately for us, verse 9 tells us specifically, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so we get the context of those verses here in verse 4. The dragon and the stars that are with him represent the Deem, or the, the angels uh, that are subservient to him being cast down upon the earth. Let's go to verse 5 now. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so we're looking at the man-child who was caught up to God. Now herein are the two big questions of verse 5. Who is the man-child? Well, We see by definition that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. We see that alluded to in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Matthew 28, 18, Ephesians 1, 20 to 21, and Revelation 19, 11 to 16. These all refer to Jesus Christ. Expositional constancy, being consistent, the law first mentioned, The man-child in this context is Jesus Christ. The meaning of being caught up? Well, a lot has been made of the fact that the the Greek word used here is harpazo, which elsewhere has been referred to as the rapture. But Jesus was taken up or ascended into heaven. Luke chapter 24, Mark 16, John 20, and Acts chapter 1 verse 9. Now, he wasn't forcibly taken, But neither is the word harpazo always meaning rapture. For the Apostle Paul, as he was rescued from the Temple Mount, we are told that the Roman guards came and harpazoed him away. They took him away. It simply means that which is something sudden and of a surprising nature. Of course, for Jesus Christ, he wouldn't be raptured because he knew what was going to take place. So he was simply taken away. Or ascended into heaven. Now let's look at number seven. I've given you six reasons, six being the number of man, but now we're going to look at the seventh reason. What do these prophets, these individuals who are saying this, what do they promise? Do they really stand behind their predictions? Let's see. So many people are asking me whether I think the rapture is this September. Listen, I hope so. I don't know. I don't have a time-traveling device to go over there and come back and tell you. I am not saying the rapture must be on September 23rd, 2017. I'm not saying that. 
So I'm going to stop there. I hope this is encouraging to you. I hope this is a blessing to you. If you're a Christian, I hope this is encourages you to look toward heaven and look toward Jesus' return. The rapture is coming soon. I won't say that it's on this date. It could be. I hope so. Am I saying it has to be next Feast of Trumpets? Of course not. I'm not a date setter. Well, I have a problem with that. If they aren't sure what they believe, then why should I believe them? You see, throughout all their presentations, they make elaborate diagrams pointing to September 23rd being the birth of the church. Scott Clark makes a big deal out of that. And that birth of the church is equivalent to the rapture. Robert Breaker, the same thing, points to it, draws a diagram, says of, the, of, of that time, that this is the rapture. Uh, Steve does the same thing. Elaborate diagrams, all giving the sense that September 23rd is the rapture. And yet all of them know to leave this uh, sort of escape clause, this caveat at the end, where they, they disclose that actually nothing may happen. Well, I tend to agree with them in the end. I agree that most likely nothing will happen. Now, I recognize that this is a very controversial subject. But on our YouTube channel, we actually encourage people to leave feedback. In fact, when you leave feedback after viewing this entire video, I want you to precede your comment with four consonants. W-T-W-T. -T. What does it stand for? It stands for watch the whole thing. I want you, if you come to this point, you'll know what to put in the beginning of your comment. Even if you do nothing other than just put WTWT. Perhaps it'll encourage people that love to just skim through things. Ask the question, what does that mean? Say, well, you've got to watch the video all the way to the end. We encourage your feedback. Uh, in fact, I will tell you, I read every piece of feedback that comes through either Facebook or YouTube. Uh, this uh, episode is a result of reading the information people send us here at Cornelia House, especially with regards to this FORGE program. And so let's just summarize here. We've read the text. We've looked at some experts. We've listened to what they're saying. We've summarized their evidence. We've pointed out some problems. And now in the end, is September 20. 3rd, 2017, the fulfillment of Revelation 12 prophecy, you decide. Until next time, may God bless you as you continue to study his word.